uh, uh, land here, uh, and um, we uh, want to honor and acknowledge the Anishinaabe and Dakota people, um, the ancestral caretakers of this land. Uh, we take this time to consider the acts of violence, displacement, and unjust treatment towards them that have occurred over the many generations. And we offer our respect and gratitude to the elders of the past, to those living today, and to those who will continue in the future for their careful stewardship of this land and its resources and for the rich cultural legacy they continue to create here. Um, I am so happy to be here today uh, and have been very excited uh, for this conversation for a long time. Um, and I, I know this is gonna be a deep conversation about uh, the Honorable Elizabeth A. Baker's process in creating this work for the AACM. Uh, so we'll learn about that and some of um, what Coco uh, helps to, uh, uh, hopes to do in her interpretation of the piece and, and how they plan to work together. Um, so as you already know, because the, um, the computer voice told you we're, we're recording this event um, and by participating, you acknowledge and agree that this session will be recorded and that we may make that recording publicly available in the future via downloading, uh, streaming or other means. Um, so um, as you may know this too, we have closed captions uh, at the bottom of this event. And so there will also be a transcript available should you be interested in that. Um, we're gonna have a, a presentation style conversation today. So um, as you can see, uh, Coco, uh, Elizabeth and I are, are highlighted. Um, we will have a, a 10 minute Q and A se uh, session uh, at the end. Um, but you're free to add any questions to the chat and uh, we'll make note of them uh, towards the end of our conversation. Uh, so now on to the conversation. Uh, I'm gonna start by introducing our amazing um, artist uh, today. I'll start with the Honorable Elizabeth A. Baker. Uh, eschewing the collection of traditional titles that describe single elements of her body of work, the Honorable Elizabeth A. Baker refers to herself as a new Renaissance artist uh, that embraces a constant stream of change and rebirth in practice, which expands into a variety of media, chiefly an exploration of how sonic and spatial worlds can be manipulated to personify a variety of philosophies and principles, both tangible as well as intangible. Elizabeth has, re has received recognition from press as well as scholars for her conceptual compositions and commitment to inclusive programming. In addition to studies of her work, Elizabeth has been awarded several fellowships, grants, and residencies, in addition to sponsorship from the um, Sean Hutt Piano Company and Source Audio LLC. As an experimental filmmaker, her work has been shown at festivals including Women of the Lens in the UK, and the African Smartphone International Film Festival in Nigeria. As a solo recording artist, Elizabeth has, uh, is represented by Arrowcade Music, um, her first solo album on the California-based label, um, Quadrivium, uh, was released worldwide in May 2018 to rave reviews. She is founder of the Florida International Toy Piano Festival, the Music Conflagration uh, Inc. Uh, Inc. and author of three books and the subject of a number of scholarly articles, thesis papers, and other academic research. In March 2018, Elizabeth retired from nonprofit arts administration to focus on her international solo career, though she remains committed to the community through workshop and public speaking engagements. Elizabeth is the recipient of the 20 19 2020 individual artist grant from the state of Florida, as well as uh, a commission for the Great Black Music Ensemble through the American Composers Forum Connect uh, program, which we're here to celebrate today, in partnership with the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, AACM Chicago. Fanfare Magazine proclaimed in fall of 2019, perhaps 
Baker will be the Pauline Olivero of her generation, and perhaps she will be more than that. I'm gonna say more than that. So welcome Elizabeth um, to this conversation. And now I will introduce Coco Lisa. Um, so Coco is a modern day Renaissance woman, hails from Robbins, Illinois, and is a producer, musician, actress, voiceover, artist, screenwriter, and poet. So we have two Renaissance <laughs> artists here with us today. She is the second uh, woman chair of the 56 year old venerable AACM. And during their second season, she was a featured musician in the critically acclaimed Fox drama Empire. I remember that, I remember that. <laughs> in 2014, Coco was a semifinalist in the Lifetime uh, Television Unscripted Development Pipeline. Coco's voice can be heard at the Ald uh, Adler uh, Planetarium in the installation Skywatchers of Africa, uh, and can also be heard in Saints uh, Row video game Ever EverQuest 2 and Watch Dogs. In 2018, she won the Alta Award for Best Original Music in a Play, and in 2019, um, Non-Equity Jeff Award for Best Original Music in a Play for Telecom. Did I pronounce that right, Telecom? Telecom? Yeah, Telecom. Um, the first uh, for an African-American woman. Coco composed music and performed in Baltimore Center stages, tour, um, touring mobile units, at, in Antigone as uh, 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 Theresius. Uh, in 2015, Coco was featured was a featured actress in George E. Lewis's film Afterward, and in the opera of the same name at the Museum of Contemporary Art. She was also uh, she was also in two exhibits celebrating the 50th anniversary of a the AACM um, at the um, the the Sable Museum of African American History and the Museum of Contemporary Art. She performed at Frankfurt, Germany Jazz Festival with Generation Now of the AACM uh, at the Made in Chicago Festival in Poznan, uh, Poland with Voice Heard, a collective of women musicians of the AACM. Um, Coco was, featured, was a featured actress on Chicago PD and on Chicago Med. Now I have to go back and watch those episodes. She recently appeared in the Midwest premiere of Toy 67 at the North Light Theater, directed by Ron O.J. Parsons. Coco was also a featured musician uh, in the book, Black Women and Music, More Than the Blues, uh, documenting the historical female musician, or historical female musician. Coco performed with the great black music ensemble of the ACM in Pisa, Italy, for the Insolent Noise Festival at Millennium Park, the Chicago Blues Festival, for the Chicago Jazz Festival. She has also performed with Renee Baker's Chicago Modern Orchestra Project. She also performed with a Hypnotic Brass Ensemble. So many ensembles. <laughs> when do you have time to do all this? She was a featured artist at Tycho Legacy 8, 10, and 11 at the Museum of Contemporary Art with Tetsu I, um, Aoki and Tsukasa um, Taiko and the My, uh, Mayumi project is at the Hyde, Hyde Park Jazz Festival. Coco's poetry is featured in, in the 99, in 99 new poems, a contemporary anthology, um, and a few of her noted recordings were in Chile, South America, with Raiza on their CD, um, Latin Soul EMI, and Nicole Mitchell's African Rising, Skylanding, the music of Yoko Ono by the Mayumi project. Raw and Alive 1 and 2 Mayumi Project 2018, The Best of Mayumi Project 2020, Resurrection Suite with Carlos Pride and Ben Lamar Gay, and Coco is a member of Astra, SAG, and AEA, AACM, and the AFM. So we have some amazing artists to, to have this discussion today. I'm so excited. So I, you know, I just want to get started and get right down to it, if you don't mind. Um, Elizabeth, um, during our conversation, you, you gave us um, a little bit of the background uh, and 
sort of your journey to this place right now um, and, and where you are with your, your practice. Um, it was a very interesting start um, that goes way back to high school. Do you mind telling us a little bit about um, your journey um, to this, this moment in your practice? Uh, yeah, so I don't know, can everyone hear me? Awesome. There's a sun shower currently happening. So, <laughs> um, well, we talked about what brought me to electronic music, um, but my journey as a musician started very early. Um, I was at least four or five when I started music lessons. Um, and really what brought me to electronic music was that in high school, I had a band as everyone does, or at least everyone did. I don't know if the kids do that these days. Um, and it was an all world band because I was a marketing genius. Um, and I knew that I knew that I could do something really awesome with that. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have very committed people in my all girl band. And so I decided to fire them and hire robots. Uh, namely the boss loop pedal. And I started with live looping, which is the most dangerous form of electronic music because you, if you can't correct mistakes, you just have to live with them as they happen. Um, and so, yeah, that was how everything started for me. Um, and then I got into Ableton Live. Uh, I was deeply involved with the experimental and underground music communities in Florida. Uh, I had a lot of friends in the punk community. And so I got my start doing electronic music sort of that way. I was a classical guitar performance major by day and secret experimental electronic musician by night. Um, and then electronic music took over because there's no career outlooks for classical guitar performance. Uh, and no one should be encouraged to make that their major ever. Um, <laughs> I always say this, uh, you can play classical guitar. I think a lot of people should play classical guitar. Maybe not a career outlook, <laughs> positive thing. So um, yeah, and that's, and so I started doing more with electronics. I went to production school. Um, I learned Pro Tools and became a certified operator, all that sort of stuff. And nobody told me no, and I didn't tell myself no. And that's how we got here. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, the, the looping thing uh, is, is a little different, obviously, than what you're doing now. Um, you know, I follow you a lot on, you know, the, the gram and, and Facebook, and I see a lot of your more modular work. And we, we talk a little bit about sort of uh, that, that connection to, uh, to, to cables and cords uh, and, and your feelings about those. I know that's that's something that we all kind of uh, latched onto in our, our first conversation. And, um, you know, you had some, uh, some interesting uh, ideas about sort of uh, the, the energy and the connection to energy um, in terms of your usage of, of modular sense. And some pretty yeah. weird ideas about what you can do with, <laughs> with cables too. <laughs> um, you know, that's a, a synth. A modular synth, semi-modular synth, you, you're sending energy from one part of the synth to another part of the synth, or you're using a cable to break the connection that's been hardwired into the synth. Um, and everything is energy, we are energy, and, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of misconception about electronic music and that it can't ever be organic, but it's to me, one of the most organic things. I, you know, when I'm playing with, when I'm playing with modular sense or semi-modular sense, I'm not like thinking, oh, this is what we're gonna do. Um, I have ideas and I know what the synths will, should normally do under regular circumstances. Mm -hmm electronics never always behave so it's always a different day of surprises but I know what the what the electronics should do and I but I also feel around a lot um I often tell people that it wasn't until I got into theremin 
and you know modular synths that I have to tune by ear that I really started feeling like a musician that could play by ear um, because I never found that the classes like the theory classes really spoke to how I understand tuning but once I got into modular synths which are completely removed from keyboards and uh theremin my ear got a lot better a lot faster so yeah it's I feel there's definitely an organic pulse and feeling in every single piece of electronics that you encounter in your life and certainly in my practice yeah that's that's really interesting and and um and so thinking about that idea of you know tuning and 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 a non-traditional um, path of, uh, of understanding music or at least a non-Western classical uh, framework. It, it seems that through this uh, ACF Connect uh, program that you were put in contact with the, the appropriate ensemble uh, to work with. <laughs> um, uh, the AACM uh, again, with their their history of really exploring, um, particularly great great black music, and and really sort of blowing up those traditional ideas of what a what an ensemble uh, looks like and what they can be, uh, to me seems to be that that great connection uh, that that we were able to make. And and also oh, really, yeah. really like, you know, there's always this misnomer of like. Black music is only hip hop or jazz mm. or R and B, but you know the AACM and the Great Black Music Ensemble, you know they they put on that on on its head that totally wrong <laughs> assumption. And in my work, I've always had that. And I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's created issues. Like I wasn't allowed to play at a black history museum because they mm. said my work wasn't black music. Um, but so it's really empowering and powerful to see so many very versatile musicians that like they, black music is defined by what they make. It's not yeah. defined by any prejudice or preconceived notions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and Coco, you're you're now leading this this uh, this ensemble, this world-renowned uh, ensemble, uh, as uh, as the the second uh, woman uh, to lead it, and um, and you know, and this transition came during the middle of of the pandemic uh, as well. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, your your new leadership at the organization and, and a little bit, um, give a little bit of background on, on the history uh, and maybe even more directly your history with the AACM. And that's a great point of reference because it's so vast and it's so explorative. It's so much to, that you can't speak on, but my entry became, came at the same time that I entered into the world as a professional musician. I was playing with a band um, called uh, Samana, which was led by Maia, who was also from the School of Music of Phil Coran, which is from the School of Music of Sun Ra, and everything else that he touched on prior to coming to Chicago. Um, it's been a whirlwind of learning and exploration and scariness and all of that and beauty. Um, and so being in this position with my mentors, my peers is exciting. It's like um, being in a room with a, a lot of, of unicorns and it's like, how do we get to create more things and how do we get to take the legacy, you know, and push it, push the envelope a little bit more in all kinds of different ways and directions. So it's just been really exciting. This project is super exciting. I cannot wait until this is like, I get to meet everybody. We get to make this wonderful music that's been written. Um, and so grateful for the relationship that happened before I came into leadership. So it's exciting. Yeah, and then you also talked about sort of your connection to this idea of energy, um, this sort of ripping off that, that, that cable idea. And, and 
Um, it was particularly interesting to, to hear you talk about um, the, the Eric Pearl book. Um, uh, the Reconnection. Yeah, and Frequencies. Can you, you talk a little bit about um, so your exploration there and, and maybe how that's connected to the work that, that you will be doing with Elizabeth? Um, I kind of started on my path as a musician, professional musician and exploring um, physics and exploring um, metaphysics at a very, very young age. And so I kind of went down this wormhole. I, I found his student before I found him. And I was watching this guy who seemed like a really cool Anthony Bourdain. He had these people on the table and he's got his hands over them and they're having these involuntary twitches that look painful, but it's not. And then feeling liberated afterwards. But energy has always been the center of what I do and being aware of it, being hearing sound, hearing things that people quote unquote call inaudible, but I can hear it or can feel it or can taste it. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that we, when we say this word in connection with music and in connection with creativity, that it sounds kind of foreign and it kind of sounds like, oh, they're talking that, you know, weird stuff, but it's the center of everything. We're electromagnetic beings. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an interesting conversation with a friend who had just had a, a session, a healing session. And when she turned on her recording, I said, that's grace. And she was like, how did you know that? But it has a sound, it has a feeling that you just know. So to intentionally take a composition centered around frequency and sound and with musicians and to bring this marriage together, it's like trying not to be too much in the way to just kind of be a gentle kind of guidance toward this process. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, I no, that's that's perfect. <laughs> and I, I mean, that leads me into sort of my next question, which is uh, just going into what uh, Elizabeth has uh, has created for the ensemble. Um, the the piece is in in three sections, um, and you know, that first section uh, is uh, is about um, biofeedback, or it's even entitled biofeedback, if if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Elizabeth, and I know that that has a lot uh, to do with uh, you know your your life and 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 some of the the journeys that you had as a as a young kid. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the creation of that first movement, uh, biofeedback. Um, so it's always ongoing creation, <laughs> um, because the idea is that. The performers are actually looking at a new video each time. Um, and so it's a video score piece. Um, and they are reacting to images and sounds that they hear um, and see on a phone or other device if they have a tablet. Um, and it's really kind of like a artistic version of uh, my experience of biofeedback as a child uh, without the scary wires and, you know, people watching you through a two-way mirror in the dark. So, except I suppose in many ways, the audience is the set of technicians in the two-way mirror. It's just, we don't have a two-way mirror. They're just, it's broken. It's not in, uh, you can see them, they can see you. Um, and yeah, I'm, it's all about really putting cognitive behavior on display. I'm not really like, I think it's great if people can play a set of notes or per, like perform a series of gestures perfectly in a row. I mean, it's like high level guitar hero, but you know, not. Um, and that's cool. But I think that there's something to be said to this adaptive quality and it really pulls out you know we have cellular memory from our ancestors in our bodies and it has a lot of effect on how we react to things uh, in the moment and so this is kind of a way to tap into all of that and if you you know in my own improvisational practice I actually 
do a lot to sort of blow up my rig, like create the possibility of an explosion that's going to go catastrophically horribly wrong, but that I have to like fake, like, oh no, it's not wrong. And then like, I'm broken out of whatever like comfort zone of how I would normally approach something uh, and have to fix problems on stage. Um, and I use that as a way to break me out of my comfort zone and cause me to have to react. And, and, and because I'm very conscious about it and like, so I could explain it in, in a way, it's, there's the Elizabeth doing the task and then there's the Elizabeth removed from Elizabeth doing the task that's sort of monitoring the things and can say, oh, but we would normally do this. What if we did this? Um, and so this is sort of my introduction into creating stimuli because, you know, a flute player doesn't really have something that they can just make blow up. I mean, they could, they could mess with their cheese, maybe like, but that's also a horrible idea. So um, it's, a, it's a good way to give people who normally cannot make their instruments like half destructive <laughs> in the course of performance, um, that sort of same tool of a cognitive disconnect that they have to solve. Or they could choose to ignore it because avoidance is, you know, one of my favorite dances. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and Coco, you, you know, you, you've uh, been able to um, spend a little time with the, the score. Uh, and uh, I would imagine that this might be uh, a little different than some of the uh, ways that the ensemble has uh, you know, made music in the past, and how do you how do you translate, or um, how are you looking to interpret this, or or get the uh, musicians to interpret uh, this this particular uh, movement? See, you're asking for the secret sauce before you buy. Oh yeah, Ooh, I know. You cannot, I cannot <laughs> give that away. <laughs> you gotta come to the show. Yes, yes, I know. In October, yes. right? In October. <laughs> in October, in October. Um, that's the fun part. Um, is well, I'll just say this. This will be the one little gem that I'll drop is to get it inside. If I can get them inside of the world, then they can get inside of the world of the composition and then create these other worlds, if that mm. makes any sense. I it makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the world the world of uh, the honorable elizabeth a baker yes um and um you know one of the things that i think is uh really you know interesting uh, about this particular piece and i you know i saw it maybe well almost a year and a half ago um and uh so i got to see some of the images and i know elizabeth you've been working um and to include more images as part of it. Um, and then we all have to recognize the pandemic and the changes that we've had to make be because of that. Um, how, do, how do you think uh, this particular movement has uh, evolved or been adjusted um, mm. because of or, or over that time uh, of the pandemic? Um, I mean, it's really adjusted because I got a fellowship from Harvard. <laughs> so uh, congratulations. I have... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I have access to financial resources that I didn't have access to before, which means I can afford gear that I didn't have access to before. Um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, you know, I had a very strange experience with the pandemic because, you know, I've spent most of my life touring as a solo artist. So I'm very used to isolation. And when I come home, um, I always say, I want to go where nobody knows my name. <laughs> and they're not glad I came. Um, so <laughs> the opposite of cheers. Um, and so for me, it's, uh, I, 
I thrive in a lot of this um, because I mean, I, you know, I was speaking to a colleague the other day and I was like, you know, I go shop at, at the grocery store on the other side of town. So I cannot run into anyone I know. Like it's uh, isolation is good. Isolation is home for me. <laughs> so um I mean, the one, the only, I wouldn't, I want to say that the pandemic gave me time, but then we also had the pandemic, you know, of racism and then the George Floyd. Now everyone wants to go talk to someone about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and they want token black people for their programs. So then it becomes fielding a lot of emails and a lot of, uh, aggressive emails from people who feel entitled to access to you. So <laughs> it was actually way more stressful and uh, there was a lot more work going on because we had all of this stuff with the people that now call themselves activists and probably don't deserve to call themselves activists. Um, because they just have now decided that because they've added a black artist to their program, even if the black artist isn't involved and didn't have a say, that makes them an activist. Kind of going off on a <laughs> tangent with that one, but I feel like it needs to be said. And so all of that made for what could have been a really restful experience, it made it a really stressful experience. Um, so, I thrived because it was something I was used to, but in hindsight, I, w I wish I had had some time to do some deep and restorative rest to prepare me for life outside of the pandemic. Um, because now I feel like, especially with vaccinations and, and stuff like that, you know, a lot of people feel like the pandemic's over. And so that expectations of access to you has increased even tenfold from what it was last year. And so I don't feel like I've ever had a moment to rest <laughs> in this last you know, time. Is it, and yes, I definitely, I definitely hear that. And it's, it's a conversation that I've had with a, a number of, uh, of artists, um, even, even locally here in, in the Twin Cities, um, especially since this was sort of uh, the center uh, for, for a long time um and yeah that that exhaustion is 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 real um i wonder C coco how um an ensemble like aacm um dealt with that um over the the course of of, of 2020 um did you all see a uh, similar sort of outreach to to the ensemble or how did you all adjust uh to sort of uh this whatever they call a new normal, which is not mm. that, that new for a lot of us, but uh, I wonder how you all adjusted uh, to, to that or what you saw during 2020. I think it, it was, for us, it was another way to bond. It was another way to come together, to kind of see it just so rapidly. I mean, you know, left and right, um, piggybacking off of what you were saying, Elizabeth, with these organizations that um, come in and want to do those types of things. But I think the, the beauty of it is the honesty and the transparency of what we see, what you're trying to suggest, what you're trying to ask for, and just being honest with them, you know, in the most gracious way that you can, um, <laughs> so that you don't look like a stereotypical, you don't have to say the word, um, is it's, it has its moments of stress, but then the beauty of it is that when you speak those words and, you, and you're coming from that place that this is not gonna happen, that I see it, it that's empowering, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we've had a lot of conversations, probably more conversations than in the old normal that we used to have where we would see each other at gigs and see each other, you know, a few meetings here and there, but there's been so many conversations about and, and about the process and what we're dealing with and, and stuff. So it's 
that part has made us come together even closer. Mm. All of those, you know, tragic things that we're dealing with. Oops. Sorry. And and yeah, I yeah, I definitely I, I hear that. And um, yeah, because you know, you have to that's where you have to go to your your community um uh, in, in times like this. Um uh, now uh I'm looking at the time now and I want I definitely want to get to um the second movement of of the piece uh, because it's it's one that it, it might be my favorite, even though I haven't heard it yet, but I like the concept <laughs> of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a string quartet, and I'm just going to say it's a string quartet. <laughs> uh, it's a string it, quartet it, that we all wanted. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I really I love this uh, sort of redefinition uh, that you talked about of the string quartet, and, and, and you talked about um, really the string instrument being seen in a very different way. Um, was part of you know the inspiration for this. So you have this string quartet that has all these other qualities uh, that may look very different to our uh, our understanding of a string quartet when we when we place it in the sort of the Western classical tradition. Uh, but that percussive element that you're talking about in the speaking. So I want I want you to dig in a little bit in, uh, on, and on yeah. And the subharmonic accompaniment. Oh yeah, you know, right. how could I forget the subharmonic? And the you know, back in the day, the string chords were jams. Like they didn't have the radio, you know. And so we're making a jam for 2021. Yeah. And uh, we're gonna make the walls rattle because that's what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> Getting low, no, no, no. Right. It's uh, it's uh, If I could use a technical term for a moment. Um, you know, when I was in electronic music class in production school, our teacher would always ask us uh, when we turned in our assignment, is it a dope ass beat? <laughs> and if, I, I, would, I, would, I would like to take everyone to 60 Minutes for a moment because Kanye West was on 60 Minutes many years ago. And probably one of the greatest moments in television history is like the old white dude from 60 Minutes whose name I never remember is like, and what exactly is a dope ass beat? <laughs> Wait, did you and Kanye gotta... looks at him and is like, you know, it's a really good track. You know, like Jesus Walks, that's a dope ass beat. <laughs> and so that's what I did, is I made a dope ass string quartet right. that has percussive elements and speaking and subharmonic accompaniment. Um, because I'm from the South and we love down tempo Southern hip hop and yeah. I, those sub tones, you know, I know there's metaphysical things. I've definitely studied, you know, like what does frequency do and everything like that, but nothing feels so good. as just like, like a pure sine tone through a subwoofer. It's just, yeah. it's and like a warm hug. <laughs> Unless your your neighbor's coming home at ten thirty p.m. and your your three year old's trying to sleep, but I do appreciate the, 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 the harmonic for sure. Hey, okay, so Coco, like this is this the first uh, sort of sub, sub harmonic ex exploration for AACM? You think? Uh, a... Yes, <laughs> yes, I'm in heaven. I'm yeah. in heaven. <laughs> I mean, but you have the Chicago style hip hop there. They they have the subs in that in that too. Oh so yeah, never... and I'm a, a househead, so you know, yeah. this this is you know this is what I grew up. I would sneak out of Robbins. I would take the car, and I would take all of my allowance and put that back in the tank, so that my parents didn't know where I was going. And just that bass in the clubs and sweat out your hair, and you come back home looking crazy. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be. Uh, very, 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 very fun to um, God. I like God. to say the word God. 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 <laughs> and then there is a strange loop. Um, and of course, I already appreciated the name right away when I saw that in the in the in the score. Um, but I want I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your uh, inspiration for the the strange loop section uh, of the of the piece. And, Oh, you're muted. 
I should unmute myself. Here we go. There you go. Uh, Strange Loops. Uh, Strange Loops is talked about by the astrophysicist the Valley. Yep. Nope, that's not right, but it gets us close enough. Um, and Strange Loops is kind of like, how do we get to intelligence? Like what makes intelligence? We don't have the answer, but we know that some sort of strange loop system gets us to intelligence. Um, and that's kind of where the idea came from. There's loops happening because there's a Zen harmonic scale um, that is a loop that is happening between musicians. And then there's the equal temperament scale situation happening between another subset of musicians. And then all together, those loops create more loops because there's these little pitch wiggles that happen um, from the differences between the pitches that are sort of close, but not quite mm. there. Um, I think, you know, and you know, I almost will have to give it away so people are not very confused as to what's happening, but you know, we have our vocalist D Alexander, like amazing singing into the F holes of an upright bass. Uh, so it creates this otherworldly thing of like, where is this, where is the sound coming from? Uh, and then we have, you know, trumpet being played into the underside of the piano and cornet pl being played into the top side of the piano. And so you're getting these very, which is a loop in of itself. You know, mm -hmm. we created an infinite loop between the soundboard and the brass and yeah, and it, they are all, all four of those instruments are playing this Zen harmonic scale of a 12 chain of perfect bits. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a really cool piece. It's basically, I feel like it's very in the spirit of ASM because it's an improvisation that I basically wrote down. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, and some of that is because you were able to uh, you know, in 2019, again, this has been a long process and <laughs> extended by the pandemic, you were able to work with the ensemble and get a sense of, you know, mm -hmm. what, what they could do. Um, so I, I think I remember the concert that you played at the Peter Cultural Center with, uh, I think, Ernest Dawkins had said, you know, she had us playing in, <laughs> you know, at the pianos and stuff. So I imagine that some of this came from that experimentation you were able to do with the ensemble. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was so. also a great concert because theremin. Anytime I get to pull out the theremin. <laughs> yeah. We were, we were um, experimenting, doing a little theremin experimentation this morning <laughs> at ACM too. So uh, we all love that instrument. Yes. For sure. you, did, was it was it a, an ether wave plus? I don't think it was that it was it was one that I had never seen before actually is it the mythical clairvox that's like the emperor's new theremin maybe I, I might have to talk to our my colleague Tim to find out which uh which version he's he's lifting his arm up he doesn't know either it was I'm still wait I'm still waiting for my theremin from Moog that I ordered in October of last year <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, I mean, come on, we all have to experience those delays, right? <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for instruments, please deliver soon. Um, okay, we're we're getting close to the mark where I said that we would open up for quest uh, Q and A, um, but uh, Coco, I, I just wanted to um, sort of wonder if you could talk about. I know you weren't there for um, the the concert uh, that time, but but that ability to work with the the artists uh, and composers for the ensemble um, and what you know how that helps um, sort of craft these pieces and and, and give you an idea of um, sort of what the composers uh, are thinking about. Um, did you think that experience with Elizabeth back in 2019 will help these musicians get into that world, that space you want them to get into? Most definitely. Um, I wasn't there, so I can't say what the experience was like, um, but it definitely will help. Um, it's, so it won't be, it's, it's not going to be completely foreign because they've already experienced it, but they just haven't experienced the plethora of, of ex exploration and how everything has developed since then. You know, they haven't seen this version of it 
Yeah. So exciting. Um, well, I, I will stop here with my questions and see if there are any questions um, from folks who are uh, in the audience today. Uh, I'm gonna try my best to look at hands raised, but if you do uh, have a question right now, you can either drop it in the chat or you can raise your hand and use that, um, that functionality. Or we can keep talking. Because there's lots that we can keep talking about. Do we see any 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 questions? Any hands raised? No. All right. Well, let's keep talking. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see. So um, one of the things I uh, also um, think is is really interesting. Again, is um, you know Elizabeth, you you spoke to your um, your fellowship at Harvard and um, and Coco, you being in leadership. Uh, now at the AECM, uh, I feel, you know, speaking of Elizabeth's comment on the sort of that negative side of um, sort of people, you know, kind of tokenizing maybe Black artists um, during the year of 2020, and probably, probably I should say before that and still, um, but you're, you're both uh, have, are, are sort of at the height or at the heights of your, your field as, as Black women. And, and I know that there are some challenges uh, associated with that as well. I, I wonder, um, you know, how how you all sort of think of your position now, um, you know, with your your fellowship, Elizabeth, and sort of your leadership position, Coco, um, and and sort of creating this place for for Black women um, to be highlighted and, and illuminated um, uh, in in our country at, at this moment in time. You, who you gonna go for? Who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. Go first, Elizabeth. I'll go, I'll go first. Go. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, for me, it was, you know, in the history of this award, they don't really have a lot of black women, and so I always feel like it's important to shatter the ceiling so the people behind you can come up through a little bit easier. Um, and so anything I do, I'm not really thinking about it necessarily like an achievement for myself, but it's achievement for all of us because if one of us can do it, then it proves, you know, all of us can do it. Um, and so I'm very cognizant of that. I also, you know, now that I am, weirdly at you know I'm in my early 30s so I'm always like weirdly like <laughs> mid-career what is that and what is that I'm not an emerging artist I definitely look for opportunities that people would give to me that I think I can't do that because I just don't have the time or you know it's it's just not the right thing for me and I actively look for emerging artists um, that would do really well in those positions where I think that a lot of people who would be in my position or, and a lot of people that are in my position sometimes, they just take every opportunity. So you see their name everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that's not really success. It's like success is when you like lend a hand for the person behind you. Um, and like when I was, younger my dad did a lot of motivational speaking and I didn't get to listen to Radio Disney and stuff like that my dad was making me listen to Macy Warner what will you do with your rope um and other motivational speakers and so in that one tape there's always this idea of like what will you do with your rope you can climb over the wall to freedom but then once you're over that wall you can always throw back your rope for somebody who fell to tighten their rope, to tie, to make the rope a little bit longer so you can help pull them back over that. You know, so for me, I think that I have worked really hard for a very long time to get these opportunities <laughs> um, and done a lot of work in the, in the darkness that most people don't know about. Mm -hmm. But I'm really ready to use these platforms to speak out about important things that we haven't um, addressed. 
and also to give opportunities to um, people who look like me who don't normally have a person visually that they can connect with when they see these opportunities um, and just be like a voice of encouragement and you can do it, just try. The worst you can do is fall and then you can get right back up again and try and get back over that wall. I love that wall, that wall image, especially compared to the image that we often hear associated with is the crabs in the barrel. Um, so I like that, that, that different take on, on climbing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Coco, and at uh, AACM, how does that feel to be, you know, in, in leadership and um, uh, after all this time working with uh, the ensemble? It feels like a natural progression in regards to when I go back 25 years that I've been around the organization. Um, I'm a, a big dreamer and um, I have really, really big ideas and, um, and love to find ways to empower everyone. Um, and so, because we have a, a variety, we have our eight, we're just like a, a regular orchestra. We have a large age ranges from musicians. Yeah. And so that our ensemble and our organization seamlessly works with one another, regardless of age and gender, um, being very transparent, being more inclusive in projects where we're working together, um, doing things that are very different. Um, I'm doing something, I'm doing my first CD right now and working with one of the um, members of the ensemble that um, Elizabeth had the opportunity to meet, which is Alexis Lombre. And she was shocked when I asked her to be my producer mm -hmm. because she had never produced anybody. But I hear that that's where, she, where, that's the sound that I want. I trust her. And I think that when we take those big risks and we allow, and see the talent and we don't look at the years and we don't look at this, that that says so much for someone's confidence when someone says that I see your leadership now, I see it and I wanna be there to help develop it. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to teach me some things that I don't know and to share for us to explore, explore this journey together and it'd be a, a new, a first for both of us. Mm. And that that is really exciting. I, I so love that's that. kind of like what yeah. I look like, like, and then also trying to get Avriel to um, get a, um, a Instagram account. Once I can get Avriel an Instagram account, then I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's that really, it really is that uh, sort of inter intergenerational connection that that builds strong communities. And I think you both spoke to that and, and how um, how we can create those spaces for for growth and connection. And how we can always learn from from people, no matter what age they are, right? They're, you know, exactly. I, yeah. Some of my my favorite local artists here are the people that I go to for inspiration and, and education. So I, I really feel that um, uh, that's so beautiful uh, for both of you. So we're 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 close to time now. Um, I uh, if there are no questions from from the audience, uh, I just I want to thank. Um, Coco and Elizabeth uh, for for being a part of this conversation. Um, I, I thought there were some really amazing nuggets in there. So I want to tell the audience that this will be available um, on I Care If You Listen uh, in, in the next uh, 24 hours or so. So if you have friends that weren't able to make it today and, and want to hear um, uh, these two amazing artists, uh, talk about their collaboration that will be happening uh, as part of the ACF Connect program and in late October, October 30th in Chicago. Um, make sure you tell them to look at I Care If You Listen for this and to sign up for our, our newsletter to find out more information about the concert. Uh, so once again, uh, I want to thank you for, for yes. I just want to say like not just for my pieces, but the other pieces that are yeah. happening. This is a destination performance experience. Yeah. Like if you've ever wanted to go to Chicago, I, I heard there's lots of good food. 
<laughs> and there you're gonna have a once in a lifetime concert experience. Yes. With I don't know the price, but it's probably it's free. It's free, free experience, free ninety nine, a free ninety nine experience. <laughs> the ninety nine is for like you know. Yes, wow. Blueberry tarts and stuff. Yes. <laughs> so nasty. Yes. No. Absolutely. <laughs> Yes, yes. They are in a technical term. It's going to be a party. Yeah, it's going to be a party, and it's once in a lifetime, and you should go. Budget now. Budget now. Get your flights, hotels, all of it. Right. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. uh, Yes. Yes. (laughs) Have a beautiful day, everyone. Visitos.